Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, is brought to you by the members of the John Adams. Why not become a member yourself, or even better, a patron, and enjoy all the extras and benefits? Find out more at john-adams.nl, john-adams.nl, and click on Become a Member. From Amsterdam, this is Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute, a treasure trove of the best and the brightest of American thinking. Something a little different in this edition of Bright Minds, the next voice you're about to hear is a name you probably don't know, but after today's show, I think you'll agree he qualifies as one of the best and the brightest. It's a real institution to start your business in a garage. Here you can see some of the four most famous garages that we have. On the top is where Bill Gates and Bill Allen started Microsoft. On the top right, we have where Walt Disney got his start. Bottom right, we have where Sergey Brun and Larry Page started Google. And on the bottom left is the garage where Steve Jobs and uh, Steve Wozniak started Apple. America's Garage Entrepreneurship, as explained by Gabe Marino. Gabe is an American Amsterdam-based finance lawyer and, in my opinion, an amazing social studies teacher. And Gabe presented a really eye-opening history of Silicon Valley for the Quincy Club. For 20 years, the John Adams Institute has organized a lecture program called the Quincy Club at schools all through the Netherlands to help young audiences better understand American culture. In 2020, we held an online live Quincy Club webinar hosted by Adams Institute director Tracy Metz about California Silicon Valley. Gabe talked about how it came to be that the likes of Facebook, Apple, Google, Netflix, Tesla, eBay, and Intel, all giants of the tech industry worldwide, settled in a valley in Northern California. And so, here with the Quincy Club is Gabe Marino and Tracy Metz. Well, what makes this place, gives it its start in any event, is the United States Defense Department and defense spending. You will see in the course of our talk this morning that the Defense Department has at several intervals played a major role in investment in technology. When World War II broke out, there were three major aircraft manufacturers in the Los Angeles area, McDonald, Lockheed, and Douglas. Um, And uh, the United States government started spending a lot of money on uh, not only on the airplanes, but also on the Uh, instrumentation that these aircraft needed. And there was, based around the San Francisco area, a lot of these small companies that were working primarily on radar. And they were beneficiaries of this terrific surge of government money. Another very important catalyst was the presence of two very important educational institutions. Stanford University, very different from the academic type of university that you had back east, like Harvard and Yale and the other Ivy League schools. Stanford was really designed to prepare its students for a life in a practical way, to have a useful way. And Stanford was also the beneficiary of a very large grant from its founder, Leland Stanford, of property. And we're going to see that that property was used to create the industrial park, in which many of today's uh, Silicon Valley giants uh, have, taken, have had their start. Beyond that private university, we also had the University of California at Berkeley, considered the crown jewel of the uh, California public university system. And Berkeley was important because a lot of the defense spending actually went through Berkeley. Anybody know what this is? Huh? It's not for cooking. It's a <laughs> transistor. And the transistor is a very simple mechanism that allows you to switch from on to off. And when you put a lot of- How big is this thing? This, this, this transistor is about as big as your thumbnail, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and it's a very simple switch. It says on and off. You put a current through it, you take the current out. And that on and off is important because if you put a lot of these together, you have the wherewithal to create computer code, which as I'm sure most of our viewers know is really nothing more than a bunch of zeros and ones put together. But let's take first a look at some of the guys that were able to get these transistors being built in California. We're going to look at a lot of pictures of old white guys. Fred Terman was a, uh, he was a Stanford-educated 
a scientist who during the war had worked on a lot of the radar. And when he was uh, brought into Stanford University as its uh, rector, he changed the entire scope of the university, making it really entrepreneurial. Um, and one of the guys that he brought back was this guy, Bill Shockley. Bill Shockley was the inventor of the transistor together with two other fellows. And he got the Nobel Prize in 1947 the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics for the invention of the transistor. Now, take a look at Bill. He looks like a pretty smart guy. Yeah, but huh? he doesn't look like a crazy scientist. No, he, but he, he was a crazy scientist, and unfortunately, he wasn't really quite as friendly as he looks in the photo. <laughs> he was a great recruiter. He was able to hire some of the smartest people in the industry to come and work for him, but he was a terrible manager, paranoid and controlling. And uh, so the guys that he hide, hired which you see in the, uh, this picture, these are some of the smartest computer scientists of the day. Uh, and these guys are known in Silicon Valley history as the Traitor's Eight, because they decided to break free from Bill Shockley, go off and form their own company. Um, this is the contract that these eight guys signed together over lunch to say, we're gonna go off on our own. They signed it on a $1 bill. We talked about the transistor on and off. Now, what Robert Noyce invented was the integrated circuit, where you had more than one transistor on a piece of silicon. These things are made of silica, which you get from sand. And here you see, we love these and things in America. It, it's a plaque. It's like a historic plaque. It's a historic plaque. You know, we love these things. The Com the <laughs> commemorating the commemorating a piece of uh, computer hardware. Huh? <laughs> we uh, love commemorating things. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, if you love commemorating things, you can look at what is called the birthplace of Silicon Valley. This is the garage oh, yeah, where the, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard got their start. The garage is an iconic place in the history of technology, filled with empty pizza boxes, you know, the imagery. But what I've always wondered is, why the garage? Why not the living room or the spare bedroom? Well, in America, everybody's got at least one car. And, you know, houses out in, particularly in the West Coast, are large ranch-style houses. And you usually have that garage. You can keep your car outside. Uh, it's a real institution to start your business in a garage. Uh, uh, here you can see some of the four most famous garages uh, that we have. On the top is where Bill Gates and Bill Allen started Microsoft. On the top right, we have where Walt Disney got his start. Bottom right, we have where Sergey Brun and Larry Page started Google. And on the bottom left is the garage where Steve Jobs uh, and uh, Steve Wozniak started Apple. Now, we're here humming along in Silicon Valley. We're producing lots of those transistors, lots of those integrated circuits. By the way, most of those are being sold to the Japanese. The United States didn't really have a, an electronic industry at the time. That was all, let the Japanese build it. We were building cars. We were building John Deere tractors. We were building- <laughs> The real stuff. All right. At the same time, of course, there was a Cold War going on with the Russians. And in 1957, this little thing was launched into space, not by the Americans, but by the Soviets. Whoa. This was Sputnik, the uh -oh. world's first satellite. And it scared the pants off the United States. All of a sudden, we were afraid that the, the communists were going to be able to reach their goal of world domination by controlling space. And so here we have again, the United States Defense Department to the rescue, pouring money into California so that we could build a space program. A space program which became uh, really a, a, an American objective when President Kennedy was elected on January 21st, 1961, when he gave his inaugural address, he said that one of the things that we were gonna do was put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. I was really glad that the space industry came up here because as, as part of that whole story of California, my father worked in the space industry as an engineer. He was a rocket scientist. And I remember vividly the first time that a mission went to the moon and came back with photos of the moon's surface with all the craters and bumps and lumps. And I remember sitting on his lap at the kitchen table, looking at these pictures of the moon and all of a sudden the moon was something you could you could almost touch. It was there in your house. And that Amazing. sense of wonderment about space suddenly becoming someplace we could go or reach out to. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I remember as a kid actually watching the moon landing. Uh, here you can see a television screen uh, showing the first uh, space telephone call 
Unfortunately, John Kennedy didn't live to see his dream realized. As you know, he was assassinated on November 22nd, uh, 1963 in Dallas. By the time we got to the moon was another individual who was in the White House, Richard Nixon. And here you see him talking to Neil, Neil Armstrong. Uh, Walter Cronkite was, of course, uh, on the microphone, the world's most, America's most famous news reporter, um, you know, telling us all about this fantastic um, uh, one step for a man one giant leap for mankind. We still remember it, eh? We yes. still remember those words, too. I was glued to the TV. Yeah. I want to take just a minute to give our viewers a little bit of background about uh, Richard Nixon, because Richard Nixon is someone that you may have been uh, hearing a lot about uh, recently uh, in light of the impeachment trial of our president. He was one of just the few who were impeached or almost got impeached. He was almost impeached. He actually resigned. But people just in time. Just in just time. Just in time because he knew he read the cards on the table and he knew he had no chance of surviving. Um, but you know, Richard Nixon gets a bad name. Of course, what he did was not correct, but he did a lot of great things. He created the Environmental Protection Agency, for example. He tried the first attempt to create universal health care in the United States. Hmm. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we were talking about the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And what he did uh, with the help of uh, Henry Kissinger was extend an olive branch to China and bring China back into the fold of countries which put Russia on the back foot and led to eventual detente. Nixon was from Yorba Linda, California. Now, now our president is taking our relationship to China in a whole different direction. Yes, and, and a lot of people will agree that there are things that in the relationship with China that don't work, but maybe the approach could be a little bit softer. Here you see a very famous image of Richard Nixon mm -hmm. leaving the White House on Marine One. That's the name of the official yeah. helicopter that is at the service of the president. Uh, he was then followed by... Trying to look victorious. Trying to look victorious, but he was a crushed man inside. Uh, you can see Gerald Ford here on the right side who took over. Let's get back to Silicon Valley now, shall we? Here we have a, uh, the world's largest computer at the end of World War II. This was ENIAC. This is a computer? This is a computer. It's, it it's... weighed 33, uh, 33 tons um, and took up 220 square meters of space and was used by the U.S. Army to calculate uh, ballistic trajectories for artillery. That's now, bigger than, that's twice as big as most people's houses. That's correct. Amazing. That's correct. Um, but I want to show you, within 20 years, um, we had this thing, which is a microprocessor, which was also invented by the team at Intel, headed by Robert Noyce. And this little gizmo, microprocessor, remember we talked about transistors, and then we have integrated circuits, and now we're at a microprocessor, which is actually a whole combination of transistors. This little baby has 2,300 transistors and um, was 17 times as powerful as this computer, which I showed you just a second ago, the, uh, the ENIAC. To show you how far we've come since the microprocessor with 2,300 transistors, if you just take your iPhone, you've got 6.9 billion transistors in your modern iPhone. That's a lot of computing capacity. We're going to talk now for a couple of seconds about the, probably the two most important players in the growth of Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak were the creators of Apple. And what we need to tell our viewers is that in those days, computing was something that nerds did. This was hacking. You might kind of uh, compare it to the gaming culture of today. People would just get together. They'd throw circuits together, they change things, they would meet in informal groups like the Homebrew Computing Club, of which both Steves uh, were members. And um, so people traded bits of circuitry or bits of software. You never paid for software, you would just take it from somebody else or somebody would give it to you. But I thought I would just show you what the first Apple computer looked like. <laughs> huh? It's quite a ways from your iPhone. Pretty closely related to the typewriter. Yes, yeah, here you can see it with the monitor. Huh? This must be in a museum somewhere, Gabe. I, actually, it's privately owned, and it's been, it's been sold for uh, 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 upwards of several hundred thousands of dollars. Uh, so if you see an it come by of on our eBay... Time. Uh, okay. Good investment. Here you have two other really important guys in Silicon Valley, and this is um, uh, Bill Gates 
and Bill Allen. And they were on the other side. So you have Steve Jobs uh, and Steve Wozniak with the hardware, and Bill Gates and Bill Allen, and they were focused on the software. And they said, listen, why should the software be free? You've got a lot of intellectual firepower in there. We want to patent it. We want to trademark it. We want to be able to get money for our intellectual property on the software. And so they uh, convinced uh, IBM to, to hire them to create an operating system for IBM, which is today known all over the world. People forget that Microsoft is still one of the world's largest uh, computer companies. And they got their start, really, with IBM with this machine which was the uh, IBM personal computer. Um, it's hard maybe for our viewers to uh, think about this, but in those days, personal computers did not exist at home. They existed really only in the office. So um, the idea of having a computer at home like we have today, or in your pocket like we have today, was not something that was really uh, uh, on anybody's mind, except for uh, back to uh, our friend Steve Jobs, who had the idea people should also be able to compute at home. And he invented, in 1984, the Macintosh computer and introduced it at uh, Super Bowl 18 uh, with the, what is widely considered uh, the most famous ad in advertising history. 6.32, left to play in Super Bowl 18, Raiders 28 to nine. This was a very expensive ad to produce. Ridley Scott, who did uh, Blade Runner, Thelma and Louise, and a lot of great films, he actually directed it. And it cost, at the time, a million dollars to produce this ad. Uh, by the way, the Raiders won the game 34 to 9. Um, <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> did you look it up? I looked it up. <laughs> uh, so Steve had this idea, we're going to get Apple computers out into the market, and we're going to defeat the 1984... Uh, 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 mind-crushing IBM, we're going to be innovative. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. IBM was just too big, and they ended up crushing the market for personal computers. You can see that just a few short years later, the Macintosh retained only a sliver of wow. the personal computing sales, and then IBM continued to control it. Um, and in fact, uh, shortly after that ad, about a year later, uh, Steve Jobs was fired from Apple, from the company that he founded. He actually soured on the whole corporate. He'd hired John Scully, who was from PepsiCola, to be the uh, uh, CEO of It was uh, kind of, of his own fault. Yes, and he, he had a separate building with a pirate flag, and, they were, they were, and, uh, and because the company wasn't really able to make a dent in the market, uh, they let him go. But, you know, Steve Jobs said that it was actually the best thing that ever happened to him because he got over his chutzpah, and he founded two other companies, Pixar and Next. Uh, Next ended up being bought by Apple Computer, which brought him back into the fold. And Pixar was ended, uh, ended up being bought by Disney. And so, it's still a, 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 an important company. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, we talked about defense money helping I'm Silicon Valley. Here we are. Fast forward uh, to Ronald Reagan as president of the United States. And he wants to have a Star Wars system in space to uh, defeat the Russians, the evil empire. And again, we have a lot of uh, federal government money, defense money, pouring into uh, the established uh, programs of space, et cetera, to try to uh, beat the Russians uh, at something actually which they were never able to do anyway. Uh, and so this money further was a catalyst for the growth of Silicon Valley. The next step takes place several years later, and here you can see you know, all these computer systems were scattered all over in various parts of the country, various parts of the world. The, the only network that was connecting them at all was, of course, a defense department network called ARPANET. And ARPANET was turned into the internet. Here we have Tim Berners-Lee. A lot of our viewers won't know who he was. But he created the system that allows all these various computer networks around the world to talk to each other. And that's HTML, hypertext markup language, which could take all different types of computer programming languages and translate them into something that allowed them to connect. Here we have the 26 words that invented the internet. All right, so we've gone all the way from the transistor to the integrated circuit to the microprocessor. These are the 26 words that created the internet that allows uh, publishers 
uh, are, are, who have websites to not be responsible for the content that's placed on them. This what, is a, is, what does CDA stand for? The Communication Decency Act, because what they were afraid of was being sued if people started loading pornography or child pornography on their sites. This is being hotly discussed. We'll talk about it a bit more in just a moment. So we're now back to gone full circle from that tiny transistor to actually having the world in your pocket. And you can see that the smartphone <laughs> in 2011 uh, overtook the sales of PCs. And in fact, today, PC sales have been flat for about the last 13 years and uh -huh. been widely really? overtaken by smartphones and tablets. When we talk about Silicon Valley, one of the other things that's really important is money. And here you can see the ecosystem in Silicon Valley is the, is the world's most important because there's a lot of money there. And these, each of these generations of, of techies that makes money, they become the investors in the new ones. That's how Elon Musk uh, became such, a, such a, 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 a serious disruptor. But I just wanted to point out for our viewers that the Netherlands doesn't do too badly. Uh, it's actually in 15th place in terms of the startup uh, ecosystems. We have a lot of accelerators here. Singapore is much smaller. Singapore is much smaller, but they've made a lot of investment in terms of attracting... attracting uh, oh, okay. Money. I think what's interesting about this whole tech culture and that you see what's coming up here is that there's a culture, because these people are real entrepreneurs, that they're willing to take risk in a way that, um, well, perhaps in the Netherlands we aren't so much. Right. And we're going to talk about some of the things that um, makes Silicon Valley tech. But first, we're going to talk about unicorns. Unicorns are in uh, venture capital parlance, uh, companies that within a very short time can reach valuations of a billion or more. We're talking about things like Tesla or SpaceX or others where in a very short time, Airbnb, you can make a killing. Uber, which are taking a huge hit now with Corona, but they're some Indeed. of our most famous unicorns. Indeed. Um, and uh, here we have the FANG stocks. I don't know if our viewers have ever heard of them, but the FANG stocks are the technology stocks that today are so a large, such a large portion of the invested capital that you see on the stock exchange. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, which is actually an A because it's Alphabet, not Google anymore. Um, and uh, they represented in 19, 2019 a 43% um, increase in value compared to the S&P, which had a 25, 23%, and actually even this year have been responsible for the a significant uptick in stock prices because they're such a large component of the indices. You know, not everything works perfectly in Silicon Valley. We're just going to focus for a couple of seconds on some of the things that these companies are facing today. There's huge criticism of these companies now. The fake news and their monopoly on creativity and on our Indeed. data. Too big, too powerful. Um, uh, fake news, as you mentioned. Uh, you can, you know, fake news actually generates more, or rather, let's say negative news generates more computer hits than positive news. So the uh, platforms like uh, Facebook and Twitter actually do quite well when there are a lot of conspiracy theories floating around. One of the other problems that we faced is... So the problem is not tech, Gabe, it's human nature. It's human nature, indeed. And we need, the, 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 but the, 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 the focus should be on these platforms adjusting their algorithms and they're well protected by the CDA, which, uh, which allows them to say, hey, we're not responsible. We've had a lot, of course, of hacking. Privacy is a big issue. Zoom, more recently, uh, you could just, uh, in fact, last night I was able to just w walk into a Zoom meeting uh, even though I wasn't invited. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, which had stolen 87 million Facebook accounts and was there used by the Trump campaign to micro-target um, viewers. Other criticism that we've heard uh, in Silicon Valley, more recently, is the enormous warehouses that sends everything to you from Amazon and a lot of these other shopping platforms. Um, you know, very hard to maintain a meter and a half distance in some of these places. And the workers have rightly said, you um, more should be more responsible for what you do with us. Actually, the job losses in the tech industry have been rather limited. That's mostly in the startups. The bigger losses in Silicon Valley have been in, of course, the hotels and the restaurants. Uh, one of the problems that we are facing with COVID-19 is a lack of programmers. You know, a lot of the programmers are coming from India or from other 
countries, and it was already under President Trump a uh, problem for these people to get visas. Uh, and now, of course, with the restrictions on flights and so on, that's become even more difficult. Uh, finally, it's a very difficult environment in which to raise money. Because, you know, to raise money, you need to see people across the table, shake mm -hmm. hands, feel, kick the tires. Uh, and that's just not <laughs> happening right now. And especially if you're doing public markets, you need to go on row shows and meet investors all over the world. So for the startups, particularly, COVID has been um, quite a big, uh, big problem. California, let's leave California, by the way, among the highest tax rates in the country. So people are leaving California. We're going to fly across the Atlantic, even though we're not allowed to. And we're going to head over to the Netherlands. Here are some of the giants that we have in tech in this country. NXP, Adyen, Philips. I'm going to just focus on two of them. ASML is probably the most important tech company you never heard of. We talked about everything from transistors to microprocessors. Well, what ASML makes are the machines that make those chips. And they have two thirds of the market for them. And these machines are highly sophisticated because what they do is they make layers and layers and layers and layers of Cinecon with all millions and billions of chips on them that we got into our iPhones and other things. So if you uh, are a Dutch person, you should be quite proud of ASML. They've been in the news a lot lately because, because of the struggle between the US and China. They're caught in the middle. The Americans don't want them to be selling these machines to China. Here's another great tech story that started here in the Netherlands in Amsterdam, Booking.com, way largest travel aggregator on the internet. Last year had revenue $15 billion and profits of $5 billion. And they've also been in the news lately, not so happily, because they took advantage of the free money from the government to keep their employees on hired after having made loads of stock buybacks. So uh, they've said they won't take any more free money. So that's, that's good. And uh, among the other initiatives we have here, Brainport is what is most like Silicon Valley in the Netherlands. It's the third largest employer with almost 500,000 people employed in different parts of the industry. And another very important initiative is uh, led by Prince Constantine, Tech Leap, which is on the starter side to try to get a lot of these starters developed, get funding. He took a group of 50 of them to Las Vegas last January. And I think really we are at what makes Silicon Valley tick. Just a couple of things. You know, in the United States, we're encouraged to go off on our own, build a better mousetrap, be an entrepreneur, dream big, disrupt, you know. Move what, fast and break things, move right? Move fast and Facebook break things, that's Zuckerberg. Uh, there's a lot of money that you can look to to build your company. Uh, there's a highly educated workforce. We talked about Berkeley and Stanford. Uh, there's a results-oriented meritocracy. There's a network of lawyers, bankers, recruiters, and accountants all floating around. It's easy to go from one place to another. There are excellent networks. There's a culture that thrives on free flow of information, uh, informal and lack of hierarchy. I think you see Zuckerberg in one of his happier days. He does not such a happy camper nowadays. There's not so much red tape in some of these uh, areas to try to foster the growth of those companies like they're doing here with TechLeap. Um, and there are favorable labor laws. You know, in many places in the country, you can't just go from one employer to another. California has very restrictive rules about that because they want people to be able to move from one place to another. And I guess really key is the American principle that it's okay to fail, take risks, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And I think that's at the heart of, uh, of American entrepreneurship, Help has been a major force in the development of our country. Thanks for viewing. Have a great day. Thank you all. The last voice you heard there was John Adams director Tracy Metz, but the day's presenter was Gabe Marino, an Amsterdam-based American finance lawyer who you wish was your high school history teacher. I wish it was my high school history teacher. Would you like to know more about Gabe? We'll link to his website in the show notes, and we'll also link to past Quincy Club topics in the show notes. Did you know that you can go to our website, john-adams.nl slash videos, where there's a link to the video of this extraordinary event. We'll also have a newsletter you can sign up for and a veritable treasure trove of great American thinkers and speakers at john-adams.nl.
johnadams.nl. And while you're there, why not become a member of the John Adams? Not only do you support what we do, you get a discount to future live events. In the meantime, you should go to wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review of this very show. This will help get the word out, and we can keep on sharing the very best of American thinkers with you free of charge. That's it for this week's show. Our theme song is called La Prensa by the Parlandos. Our editor is Tracy Metz. From Amsterdam, this was Bright Minds, the podcast from the John Adams Institute. I'm Jonathan Goubert. Thank you for listening.